How are we going to know when it's time to panic? Hi, I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle Now. And Bill, of course, I'm speaking about the growing concern around the world of the COVID-19 or novel coronavirus uh, pandemic, if you want to call it that. It's a pandemic in some places, not in others. Um, the Drudge Report's website is now just nothing but a flood of headlines about various things that are happening as a result of this. Everything from the stock market uh, continuing its plunge on the day we record this, it dropped another uh, more than 7%. Um, you know, in addition to stocks tanking, the entire country of Italy uh, almost is under lockdown. Some 60 million citizens are asked to quarantine themselves. The State Department is warning U.S. citizens against going on cruises, especially those who are in a vulnerable age group. Um, some 100,000 people infected globally now and more than 3,800 people at the most recent report, uh, according to Johns Hopkins University by way of CNBC. Uh, 3,800 plus people have died of the condition. Uh, Bill, I, it occurred to me that, you know, while you're hearing a message from uh, the White House of stability and that we're doing everything we can, uh, late this afternoon, President Trump and Vice President Mike Pence made some announcements that they're going to offer some relief uh, to small businesses, perhaps some tax relief to people who are hourly workers. Um, who may be afraid to be able to, you know, go into work when they're not feeling well. Um, all of this stuff is happening. I know it's probably not as horrible as the media is making it sound, but the coverage itself, Bill, seems to have taken on a life of its own. And I don't mean this as a critique of the media. I just mean like, how do you how do you actually stop for a moment and say, okay, what's really happening, and how concerned should we really be? I realized earlier today, we're recording this on Monday, I realized earlier today that the hysteria over COVID-19 is going to burn out before the disease does, that the hysteria over COVID-19 has probably got another two weeks of lifespan in it. And then when people realize that they're not stacking bodies in plastic bags in the Home Depot parking lot, they're going to slowly begin to realize that this is another situation that is overhyped beyond any recognition whatsoever by a society that faces and has faced so few real threats that anything becomes a, a matter of this kind of mass hysteria. Are you saying this uh, basically in the United States because our response to it is going to be much better than in some other nations, nope. South Korea or China, for example? No. Nope. Let's just, let's just, I've been talking with a few epidemiologists, virologists, and so on. So let's just talk about, about what's fun, what I think is fundamentally going on, not medically and not even in terms of containment, socially, in terms of, the, in terms of how society is reacting to that. This is something I'm, I'm um, capable of commenting on. And here's what I think is happening. Um, COVID-19 is, is one of many different kinds of coronavirus. It is an influenza type virus and it is, ex, it is extremely contagious. It's all flu is contagious, common colds are contagious. It is contagious primarily because it's spread uh, through the air. You can, you can cough on a surface or cough in a room full of people. The virus survives in the microscopic droplets of that person's uh, bodily fluids. They're inhaled and then you can develop um, the virus can get inside your system basically and start doing what viruses does. So the bad news about COVID-19 is that it is an infectious virus in the same way that the flu and the cold is an infectious virus and for precisely the same reasons because it's basically the same kind of virus. That's the bad news. The good news is, is that the mortality rate is actually pretty low. It's higher than, the, it's higher than regular seasonal flu, significantly higher, but it's not, it's not, a plague, and, and what I think is happening socially, socially, is this. Whatever it was, six, seven, eight years ago or whatever, there was an extreme amount of panic about the Ebola virus breaking out. And I did a video on this, I want to say, right at the peak of the Ebola uh, uh, hysteria. And I said this disease is going to be containable and will be containable because of a factor called R sub naught, it's, it's basically a simple number. It's easy to understand. If you have a person who's got Ebola, how many people is that one person likely to infect? And in the case of Ebola, it was actually a little bit less than one. 
So that disease is a containable disease. If you had Ebola, if you were going to catch Ebola, you had to physically come into contact, physically touch the blood of somebody who had Ebola. And furthermore, you had to have some means of that blood getting into your own blood, which is a, a cut in the skin. So Ebola was hard to catch. But if you did catch it, its mortality rate was very high. COVID-19 is pretty much the opposite end of the, of the spectrum. It's, it's easy to catch. And that's why it will not be contained. It cannot be contained. Once it's out, it's out. You can't contain a flu or, or, or a cold. You can try and you can do everything in your power to, to lessen it and so on. And the government is taking all of the appropriate actions. But when you have a disease that infects three or four or five people from each person infected, it, the, the, you know what the, this thing's going to do, Scott? It's going to go viral. That's where the term came from. Well, and it's Bill, that's a multiple. report I read about a week ago that basically said that the great danger of COVID-19 is the very fact that its mortality rate is relatively low and the transmission is relatively easy. And so the fact that it doesn't kill you right away actually allows you to circulate in the population when you're asymptomatic. That is, a, that is a misleading statement, although it's an accurate statement. And the part of what you said is that even though it doesn't kill you right away, you've already built the fear into that sentence. Because what you should have said in terms of statistics, in terms of any rational approach to this disease is, even though you don't show, even though it doesn't make you sick right away, it's not going to kill the enormous majority of people. If you look at the mortality rates on, on who's dying of, of COVID-19, you find that the huge majority is over 90 or over 80. And, and to give you an example of the, of the, when I say hysteria and irrationality, this is being driven by coverage that if, if not intentionally designed to, to ramp up sales is at the very least negligent. I'll give you a great example. I don't remember how long ago it was now. I want to say it was about 10 days ago, something like this. And there was a big headline that says, first uh, coronavirus death reported in the U.S. Okay, I thought that's interesting. You know, let's see if this is a, a linebacker for Ohio State who's perfect health and the next day just suddenly kills over and drops dead. Let's find out about this first death in the United States. And it turned out that the first man who died from this in the United States was already in a case of extreme re uh, respiratory uh, distress. He, he'd had a, a serious heart conditions. He essentially was on death's door anyway. He tested positive for the disease. He died. And this was listed as America's first uh, uh, COVID-19 death. Now, that kind of thing is useful to know. It's useful to know that the first person who died in America from uh, who tested positive from this was a person who was so remarkably sick in the first place that affects your judgment on what you what you value this fear level at. Now, what I'm saying is this, that this virus so far appears to have a mortality rate. And when you get right down to it, when we're dealing with a flu-like virus, which this is, it's the mortality rate that we're interested in. In other words, you can catch Ebola, survive Ebola, but have Ebola do horrible, horrible things to you and still survive it. But in a case of a, of a, of a flu-type virus, when, when you recover, as virtually everybody will, it's a full recovery. So what I'm getting at is this. It appears now that, that the COVID-19 virus is more deadly to people who are at risk than the seasonal flu, significantly more at risk than the seasonal flu. But the number of people who catch this disease, it's turning out to be, I don't know what the exact number is as of today, but significant numbers, like 30, 40, 50% of the people who've tested positive for this virus didn't even know they had it. They didn't know they had it and they're never gonna develop symptoms from it. And as it turns out by weird coincidence, about two hours ago, I got a text from my cousin who is in quarantine on a cruise ship trying to return to Australia, and she tested positive for the COVID-19 virus, and she was symptomatic, and she said it was like a bad head cold for two days, and that's what is going to happen to virtually everybody who comes in contact to this disease. That doesn't mean everybody's going to get in contact with the disease, but the disease will go everywhere. So here's what I'm trying to say in a nutshell. This is it in a nutshell. When you have a disease like Ebola, which is a very nasty, nasty piece of work, and you watch seven, eight years ago, you watch the efforts to contain Ebola, which were successful because Ebola is a containable disease. When you watch the effort to build a wall around the outbreaks of the viruses and succeeded, people went, Whew. now they're seeing the same thing with COVID-19. And all they're seeing is this virus getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And folks, it's going to continue to get bigger. It is, it, 
it is not possible to contain a flu-like virus, certainly when it's reached this state of, of, of morbidity, which is a matter of how many people are already infected. So here's the answer to, to your worries and concerns. If you're a healthy person, you essentially have nothing to worry about. If you have a respiratory problem, if you have heart problems, something that might make it more difficult for you to fight off an extremely severe flu, then you are at higher risk. But you're not living in America anyway, and in virtually everybody who's watching this on the internet, you're not living in a world without defenses. Many times, if not most times, the virus doesn't kill you. The virus is so, is so busy with your, your immune system is so busy fighting this new virus that, that secondary infections set in like pneumonia and, and pneumonia is a treatable uh, infection. I'm not saying that people are going to die. And I'm not saying this is a swell thing. And I'm not saying, ah, oh, nothing to worry about. What I'm saying is, is that no one is addressing this in the correct way. And in my opinion, the correct way to address this is to understand that a, that a, a flu-like virus is so contagious that this thing is out and it's going to get out and efforts to contain it and canceling South by Southwest and all the rest of this stuff. All this does is increase people's level of panic. And, and that's really what's what's hurting the economy. You're going to find out that the virus did very little damage to the economy when it's over. So you what's think even though there is this panic, Bill, you don't think it's a prudent thing to cancel events like South by Southwest? Absolutely not. I d absolutely do not think because so. Because the <laughs> threat even then is is fairly minimal. I mean, people don't want to get sick even if it doesn't kill them. If I told you that we were going to cancel South by Southwest because uh, two people who were planning on attending had the flu, would you cancel the, the, the concert? I've never run a concert. No, I haven't either, but I suspect I wouldn't. And, and listen, because so, I know people are so quick to jump on one aspect of one thing you say and try to make that into your entire position. This is more than the flu. It is more severe than the flu. It has a higher mortality rate among people who are at risk than the flu. But, but this is not yellow fever, this is not Ebola, this is not bubonic plague, this is not the kind of thing that people feel like it is, this scythe that's just gonna cut through the population. It's not. So it it's almost seems like the worst impact of this disease may not necessarily be, uh, you know, a respiratory uh, distress, uh, but rather uh, decline of mutual fund assets, uh, no. businesses Here, threatened with yes, failure, yes. potential bankruptcy, um, yes, and then, this is, as Franklin yes. Roosevelt would say, fear itself. Correct. That is going to be the effect of the virus on the economy long term will not be a result of the virus. It will be as a result of the fear of the virus. The primary threat of this virus, in my opinion, the primary health threat that this virus is causing is that because the level of hysteria is so high, whatever medical resources we have available to us now will be dispersed among people who don't need them because they are in such a state of fear. Let me finish what I said a second ago. With the disease with, with the disease that's as infectious as the common cold or the flu, you cannot build a wall around the virus. It's out and it's gonna continue and you're gonna see these numbers get bigger every single day. And that's just the way it's going to be. So what you have to do now is you have to change the way that we as a society and that we as individuals think about this particular virus and how it spreads. We cannot build a wall around the people that have the virus and contain the virus inside those walls. So what can we do? Well, we know who's at risk. We know who has got particular problems with this kind of a disease. My sister, as a matter of fact, has pretty severe respiratory problems. I spent an hour with her on the phone, you can't, at least an hour. Since we can't build a wall around the infection and contain it, what we have to do now is we have to build a wall around the individuals who are actually susceptible to suffering severe consequences from this from this. Uh, particular virus. And what that means is for people who are in the high risk category, people who do have existing respiratory problems, people with severe uh, emphysema maybe or asthma. In this case, I'm not a doctor. I don't know what those symptoms are, but certainly I do know people whose systems are not fully there. Maybe they've got a weak heart. And if you have a flu, an extreme flu, your heart has to work harder. You've got all these fluids to, to, to get rid of and so on. Those are the people that we need to protect now Rather than building a wall around the virus, it's out. Let's build a wall around the people who are at risk. And my primary concern about this virus is that there are going to be so many people because no one has sat down and explained this whole thing to them, 
just explained it to them. People are going to get a cold or the flu, or maybe they're going to get the COVID-19 flu. And they are immediately going to drive down to the hospital. And there are going to be lines and lines and lines of people, all of whom have flu-like symptoms and virtually none of whom are at any risk at all. They're at the same level of risk as anybody else who gets a, a severe flu. Although this doesn't even seem to be that severe flu in most cases. Some people don't even know they have it. But the risk is, is that there are going to be so many people for whom this would be let me rephrase that. There are going to be people who are going to develop symptoms of this, and they're going to go to the hospital wrapped in terror, convinced it's the end of the world for them and their families. And what's going to happen is they're going to demand to be tested for this virus, and they're going to get tested for it. It's going to come up positive, and the doctor's going to say, you should go home, lie down, drink plenty of fluids, and get some rest. And that's what the, and that's what the medical advice for the vast majority, the huge majority of the people who are exposed to this virus is. But the risk, the, the actual problem with what we're seeing now is that the people who do need medical attention, the people who actually do have a chance of being damaged or killed by this because it is it is hard on their respiratory system already, those people are going to be standing in line behind hundreds of people who don't need hospitalization, but they don't know that they don't need hospitalization. And we saw a great example of this almost exactly 100 years ago. The, the peak of the, of the worldwide flu pandemic at the at the in the beginning of the last century was October September October of 1919 into 1920 so virtually exactly 100 years ago and here's a couple things that we found about that first of all that flu was a killer that flu was nothing like covid-19 the 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 1919 uh, epidemic was a really nasty deadly piece of work that flu was so deadly that most people who died from that flu were in the prime of health because that flu multiplied so quickly that people died from their own immune system the people with the strongest immune system died died in 1919 that's how nasty that my, particular my great was. grandfather's first wife died in that influenza yes that was that was a genuine that was something to be worried about. That was a real threat and if we were talking about that virus you would not be hearing me saying what I'm saying today but let me just say one thing that is historically accurate and bears directly on what we're talking about from a cultural point of view when it was over, and, and I mean, when it was over, I'm talking about in the decades and the years and the reflection, the statistics, all of it. What they found was that the thing that caused people the most fear was for the government to say, don't worry, we're doing our best. We've got this under control. There's nothing to worry about. Now, I happen to believe that there's really nothing to worry about. But the difference between what I've been saying for the last 15 minutes and what and what the government, that's not the government. The government's doing a great job. It is really doing a great job. What the, what the media is not doing either through laziness or, or, or fear or just neglect or whatever, is no, one is no one is taking the time necessary to understand that every single epidemic which becomes a pandemic is an entirely different disease and that means that the way you have to fight it is different. If we were talking about a yellow fever outbreak, we wouldn't be wearing masks because these, these cotton masks wouldn't do us any good at all, none. We wouldn't be talking about that because yellow fever is spread by mosquito bites. And apparently if we the were masks facing, don't do a heck of a lot of good with this one either. Well, the masks, to some degree, the masks will contain the particles from a person who is uh, infected with the disease. And so it's not like the mask is gonna filter out viruses from the air, because it can't do that. But a mask can contain some, some of the sneezing and the, and the coughing and so on that happens fr from a person who's got this disease. But, but look, this is what I'm saying, this is why this is so important. If we were talking about a yellow fever outbreak, we wouldn't be talking about getting uh, masks and so on, and we wouldn't be talking about washing our hands. If this was yellow fever, we'd be talking about looking for standing bodies of water and spraying them with DDT to eliminate the mosquitoes, which is the vector that transmits that particular disease. If we were dealing with Ebola, we'd be dealing with a group of people who have to come into physical contact with the blood of a person who's infected. And if a person is sitting on a couch bleeding out of the eyes, that's a pretty clear symptom that you don't wanna go particularly near that person. That person is deathly ill. When you're dealing with a, with a flu-like virus like this, especially one with an incubation period this long where you can literally be as asymptomatic for four or five weeks, not even know that, that you've got it. These kind of things are just generating hysteria. 
So, Bill, and, I, and, I tell you, I've read a lot of coverage of this thing, and I've yep. read in the New York Times and the Washington Post stories that contain the same kind of facts that you're bringing to the fore here. So it's not that the information isn't out there, but I also see a different kind of approach on places like the Drudge Report or, you know, some sort of conservative news sites and liberal news sites that, are, that seem to... Uh, they seem to value traffic to their websites more than they do the public health. Um, how do how do you dial something like this back? Because it's not really it, it is spread through the air in a sense. It's spread over the radio. It's spread over television. Um, it's it's not as much people breathing and sneezing as it is people sharing and clicking on clickbait headlines and tweeting. My sister in our conversation uh, yesterday or two days ago, um, told me, absolutely true now, she told me that down in, in, in Fort Lauderdale, she has three friends who have boarded themselves in their houses. No fooling. They have bought a month's worth of food and water, locked the doors, bolted them, and are sitting there, and they're not going to leave their house for however long it takes. My I wife just told me there's no toilet paper at Costco. I've heard that too. Um, and this is what happens when you have. And when that uh, happens, Bill, you can't not buy something. Like in, she bought a, a big container of, uh, of facial tissue. You know, it's like, well, what what happens? Even if everybody else is panicking, you can't just go, well, I'm not going to panic. Everybody else is panicking. I'm going to keep my head and, and run out of toilet paper. Well, yeah, it's like the so so what's what's so what's the harm in COVID nineteen? Is it is is that people run out of toilet paper? Well, Again, not entirely. No, no, I've, no, I've loved on, ones in the airline on, hold industry, hold on, hold and they're on. flying empty planes. Of course they are, and 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 of course they are, and they're canceling music events and so on, as if they can contain a flu-like virus. It, they can't. Now, this is the thing you asked about. How do you stop this? It's funny you mention this because it's only within the last 24, 48 hours that I've started to to think about the public response, the 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 new. Let's just call it the news. I've only begin to think about the people's the people's consciousness of this is behaving in exactly the same way that a virus does, that it's multiplying and it starts out small. And then you hear about it from more and more places. And the more places you hear about it, the more the more uh, agitated and afraid you become. Then you become part of the virus and you start broadcasting all this fear out and all this. And everybody gets everybody gets amped up. And then this virus of 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 unreasonable fear spreads throughout society and it's carried through Facebook and it's carried through uh, news media and so on. So your question is the, is a very good question. How do you stop it? Well, the way you stop it, I think culturally is the same way that you stop it biologically. You cannot control the virus out there. All you can do is 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 protect yourself. And when I say protect yourself, I don't mean barricade yourself behind a wall. Protecting yourself in the case of the virus and in the case of, of the social virus is a matter of education. If the education system in this country wasn't so miserable and so intentionally neglected, if they taught fundamental biology, I'm not a biologist, I just know enough biology to, to know where to look for research. If if the educational system was not as bad as it is, we wouldn't be having this reaction. So what happens to what happens to you when you're exposed to a disease? When you get the measles, and let's say you didn't get a measles vaccine, I'm talking about in the olden days, if you got the measles, which is 12 times, uh, every person has measles infects 12 people, it's, inc it's probably the most infectious disease there is. If you had the measles and your body won the battle with the measles, your immune system is so profoundly developed that it not only fought off this foreign invader, but it remembered them. So when the measles comes back, if you survive the measles, you don't get the measles again because your defense system, your immune system recognizes that pathogen. And the second it appears, it doesn't have time to start doing damage. It's instantly killed by your body's immune system. This is what a vaccine is. A vaccine works by giving you a weakened version of a disease your body recognizes the disease. The weakened version doesn't do you any serious harm. Your body now recognizes this invader. And when the invader comes back, it doesn't have to have a overwhelming destruction before it starts to attack. This is how vaccines work. Stay with me because there's a social issue to this, right? So 
Flu vaccines don't, you have to, every time you get a seasonal flu vaccine, if I go down and I decide to get my flu vaccine for the, for the year, that's actually a vaccine of maybe 15 or 20 different sp- strands of flu that happen to be the most prevalent because they're all a little bit different. The flu changes so quickly that your immune system can't recognize it because otherwise, if it didn't, you would have a cold once in your life and then you'd be immune to the cold. You'd never catch the cold again. Your body would recognize it, but that virus is changing very quickly. Same for the social virus. So all you can do to stop the spread of this social disease, this, this panic, is to immunize yourself is to develop in yourself an immune system and hope to do what I'm doing now, and that is to inoculate other people, not against fear, because there's something to fear here, but against unreasoned fear and against and against panic and against hysteria and, and make it so that we treat this thing like adults, not like children. And by treating a disease like adults, we begin to realize that when you have talked about a situation that is now out in the world, Again, the the sum total of this, in in my opinion, is to stop thinking about building a wall around the virus and start thinking about building a wall around the people who are susceptible to harm or death from this particular virus. And that is an entirely different way of thinking. And once you understand that, once you understand that, you realize that you and virtually everybody listening to to this broadcast right now have nothing to fear from this disease. But... I have two relatives who are at risk, and I worry about those people, and I am making as many efforts as I can to protect them. Those people do benefit from maybe not going to work every day or maybe not going to work at all. Certainly, they benefit from from not making physical contact, or if somebody in the office is sneezing, it's time for people who are highly at risk to go home. But to simply say that this is just, we got to shut down society and board up the windows, you know, until the bring out your dead cart goes by, This is what makes me believe what I said in the beginning, Scott. The only way this hysteria is going to die down is, I'm serious as I can be about this, the hysteria over this virus is going to die down when it becomes boring. And that's what's going to happen. So Mark here, my here words. are two opportunities that we have on a practical basis, and we'll we'll end with this, Bill. And uh, because we're actually in in a way, we're kind of part of the information stream now that goes yes, out are. about that. Okay. So there there are two things I want to ask you about, and the first one is, if you were writing the headline for this video, how would you write it in a way? That I'm not asking you to come up with a headline right now, sure. but how would you write it in a way that would engage people, but without using the phony clickbait panic, uh, you know, standard that it seems to have infected so many on social media? I think I would probably call it unfearing the coronavirus. I'll write that down. <laughs> and you think people would watch that? I don't know, um, because I'm not offering I'm not offering survival tips. If we called it how to survive the coronavirus, sure. we'd do real well. Uh, but that's a lie, and and it's the lies that have gotten us into this trouble. Um, I would call it unfearing the coronavirus because not because there's not because there's nothing to fear. There is. There is something about this that is genuinely worth our attention. But, but Scott, here's the thing. What we don't realize consciously and, what, and how we inoculate ourselves against the fear is to understand what this threat is and what its, dam- what its potential damage is and what we can do about it. And solving the problem of the social fear, the contagion of fear, we have to immunize our, ourselves against what we what we are wired to to believe in biologically. I believe this with all my heart as well. The one thing that is genetically embedded in the human mind, if there is a collective, if there's a collective unconscious, if there's something that we all share as a species now, as a species that has that has been repeated so many times that it's actually part of our subconscious structure. It's not learned behavior, in other words. It's epidemics. That's the one thing that humans fear more than anything else, and rightfully so. Every war in history, it, with the exception of wars after 1945 and penicillin, disease killed far more people than, than the battles did, far more. And up until fairly recently, the, the terror of these diseases was not only that they were so widespread, but nobody knew what caused them. 
we have made enormous advances in this regard, and now we have to start making some advances in our ability to to inhibit and then and then quarantine the spread of disease. So if we want to stop the spread of the social disease, so if we want to stop the spread of hysteria, the first thing we do is what we would do with any other kind of an illness, is we quarantine the hysterical. And that starts with you. That starts with you. It starts with you by understanding and doing a little bit of research on who's at risk and who's not so that you don't become a carrier of the fear, right? If you, if you, if you, if you were afraid of this, and I was for a very brief period of time, if you were afraid of this and you learn enough about it so that you're not afraid of it, you're not only immune forever for COVID-19, you also now become an antibody. You can help other people's immune systems. And I'm talking about the fear now. And so this is how you interrupt the spread of viral fear. First thing you have to do is you have to develop your own immunity to the fear. You have to develop your own internal immunity. And once you're immune, then you can start to help immunize your family. And once they're immune, they can start to, at the very least, if not immunize others, then at the very least, they're no longer fuel for the fear. And then the fear burns itself out. And, and this, is, this is what we're watching. And since the news media won't behave responsibility enough, when I say responsibly, the news media will not, will not write a headline like first man to die of coronavirus in US was terminally ill to begin with, which appears to be the case. They won't write that headline. They'll write first death confirmed in America. So we have an opportunity and we have an obligation to immunize ourselves against the threat. But the thing I was going to say, and this is certainly the last thing I'll say is a long episode, is that, is that COVID-19, the coronavirus, is going to join the chorus, the, 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 the crowd of things that we have that we fear and appropriately so. We fear driving drunk. We fear walking down dark alleys in, in unknown sections of certain cities. We fear uh, leaving, we fear eating a sandwich that's been in the fridge for three or four days. We fear any number of things. We fear being fired. We fear our stock market's gonna, portfolio's gonna tank. We fear a number of things. And all of these things are things that are should be fearful of, but not to the degree that they become obsessive. And I think that what's gonna happen is that this virus is gonna fold itself into uh, just one of the many flu strains that we run into every single year. And there will be a vaccine developed for this. And if, it, if COVID-19 changes as fast as other flu viruses seem to, and we hope it won't, then it will be part of the flu cocktail of shots that we get if you decide to get a flu in, uh, uh, vaccine shot. And if you don't, then you then look, I, I've had a flu vaccine. I live in California and that really is a difference because my wife from Moscow got the flu every month. But I live in California and I've lived here for 38 years and I've had the flu once. And I've had flu shots maybe three out of those four of, of those years. So even though the flu is endemic, it's everywhere, most people don't catch it. And if they do, they have a miserable couple of days. And that's I know, what's going to I know the show has run twice as long as our average episode, but there is a final question that we have to deal with, and it's very personal uh, for us here. Um, the State Department announced uh, within the last couple of days, uh, alerted Americans to avoid going on cruise ships, specifically, uh, and, and especially Americans who are in that risk uh, kind of category that you were talking about. Um, we have a cruise scheduled for uh, May 15th through the 18th. Uh, the bookings are, are closed now, so nobody else can sign up for it. But we have a bunch of people signed up, and they're going to go with us on that cruise. Um, my wife and I were talking about this last night, and I jokingly said, uh, oh, absolutely, we're going on this thing because we'll have the ship to ourselves. <laughs> but I don't think that's really going to be the case. Um, what would you say to the people who have, not just with us, but who have already booked travel or booked cruises, and, and I'm going to ask you to keep this as short as possible because I'm running out of uh, Betamax. Yep. My attitude towards our cruise is that I am going to continue to blithely assume that we're going on that cruise until I hear otherwise. And if we hear otherwise, it will be a decision external to, um, to BillWhittle.com. It'll be a decision on the part of the cruise line. If the cruise line doesn't cancel the cruise, I'm going. And if I'm the only person on the ship, I'm going to have a great time. I'll be there as well. Uh, Yep. 
But I also ate that sandwich in the refrigerator, so um, you won't be- it Made you sick. Did it, make, did it make you sick? Nope, never did. It didn't? No. no. In sick. fact, I, I, I tell you, I've lived my entire life that way, and my wife will tell me, you didn't eat that, did you? And I say, yeah, I did. Why, why do you ask? And she said, because it had mold all over it. And I'm like, really? Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe uh, we find that playing in the mud, instead of making us sick, yeah. we're probably likely to find that if we go out and play in the mud- <laughs> It keeps us healthy. Well, the folks who have enabled us to play in the mud of the news uh, are the members at BillWhittle.com, and we are grateful for their uh, financial support of this enterprise. Also, for our buddies over at the Patriot Post, America's News Digest, uh, there you can go and subscribe to their updates over there. And when you do that, right now they are offering the Patriots Primer on American Liberty, which not only you will enjoy yourself, but you'll find that it helps you to explain the concepts behind the foundations of this country, especially to young people, and but to others as well uh, in ways that are, are that are winning. Um, and so we invite you to become a member at BillWhittle.com by going to that website and clicking that Become a Member link, and uh, we'll provide a link to the Patriot Post and to that free primer on American liberty in the description below. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks for watching.